I just love you and worship you. I just ask that the things that you've burned in my heart, I would be able to convey them and they would somehow touch the hearts of these people here that are hungry for you, hungry for your word, hungry for direction. I thank you in Jesus' name, amen. How many of us prayed on the way here in your car or in the plane or whatever, prayed and said, Lord, change me? Anybody pray that? Well, we get what we deserve, right? God is doing some changing. On, on the plane coming here, it's like, you know, I think some, sometimes those words we say are, you know, just becomes religious. You know, God changed me. God, I want to be changed. The thing that I've noticed lately, though, is that the more I get closer to him, the more I realize I don't even know him. The closer we get to him, we realize and can see, I'm so far away. I, I, you know, sometimes we think we have it. We think we've, you know, like Tommy Tenney says, we, we think that we're, we're, we're getting a glimpse of him, we're catching him. But when we finally really do get close enough to him, we realize how far away we really are. And so God is, is doing some things at this meeting. I know Pastor Van has talked about it. I know Mark and I, I mean, you know, we're taking some hits here. You know, it's not just you. We all are being affected. And the reason why is because God is doing some things right now. And if we tune our ears to him, we're going to follow him and we're going to be close to him and we're going to be with him in the change that's happening. Does anybody sense that out there? Does anybody realize that, it, it's like the times are changing. In fact, let's look at um, Luke chapter 12. You know, right now, I'm sure um, Brother David feels this way, but um, we're hearing people talk about children and youth today that never uttered a word about them before. All over the world, all over the country. And you're going, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. Uh, it was probably... Um, Oh, about nine months ago, I was, you know, flipping through the channel, and TBN was on, and, and Benny Hinn was having a service. And at this service, he, at the very end of his um, healing service or whatever, he had all the youth come up and children, everybody under, you know, whatever it was. I don't, I don't know the age, but young people were up there all in front of the platform. And he just began to pray over them, and they just went down, you know, how they do in his meeting. And afterwards, when he was sitting around kind of talking a little bit about what was going on, he said, you know, God is doing some things in young people today. And I heard him say, now I don't know that, that if it's happened or what's been happening, but I heard him say that he's going to be making a place for young people after his healing services to pray for them, to impart into their lives. And this is a, you know, a huge national ministry recognizing that God is doing something in young people's lives today. And um, we're, we're there. We're here. But, you know, we need to pay attention to what God's doing. Because revival and the things of God, it just never just stays the same. You know, the Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. But the signs and the time, we're the ones that are changing. Do you realize that? The closer we get to him, the more we see what we really have to be doing. And uh, in Luke chapter 12, verse 54, it says this, And he said also to the people, When you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway you say, There cometh a shower, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be heat, and it cometh to pass. Ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern the time? There, the sign, there are signs right now that we need to be following and we need to be changing. We need to get out of our rut that we're in and we need to move with God. Otherwise, we're going to be sitting back there left behind, like Pastor Van was talking about. I'm just going to say this really quickly. There's a book that we read with our staff and with our interns this last week. It's not a spiritual book at all, but I'm going to mention it because it can locate some of us so well. It's called Who Took who Moved My Cheese is the name of it. The author of the book is the author of The One Minute Manager. And they're in the air, all the airports and everything. You know, Mark travels so much, so he saw that. And um, it tells a story of um, four mice. I'm sorry, two mice and two little small humans in a maze. And the two mice, their names were 
Sniff and Scurry, and the two little people were called Hem and Ha. And um, they set out each day from their house to find where the cheese station was. And they, they finally, they find the cheese station, and they start nibbling away, and they, they nibble for the day, and they go home, and they go back the next day. They put on their little shoes and go back the next day. Well, one day, all of a sudden, they all showed up, and the cheese was gone. There was no more. And Sniff, right away, started sniffing to find out where do I need to go to find more cheese. Scurry realized, I'm going to stay with Sniff, and so he took off. So they both took off, and they found, after going through the maze, all the different little mazes, they found the way to the cheese, and they were um, being fulfilled. Now, Ha was kind of like, well, where did they go? And where's my cheese? So for a long time, he kept going back to the cheese station, thinking and hoping, you know, I like this place. It's comfortable. I don't want to move. And, but still wondering, where's the cheese? It's got to come back. I know it will come back. Someone will bring it back. Finally, he decides, no, I'm going to go find it myself, and he takes off, and he finally finds it. Where, where Ha, it just stays there the whole time. He's not willing to get up and move. And so um, the book is not a spiritual book, but Mark got that. They use it for organizations and stuff. And you can identify yourself. When the Spirit of God is moving, are you a sniff? Are you ready to, you know, as soon as he moves, are you with him? Are you a scurry when you see other people going? Are you like, hey, let's go? Are you a ha where you're going to wait around until God has to, you know, light a fire under you? Or are you a hem where you're just going to sit there and watch God move by and say, you know, it was good. It was good. We had the cheese. We don't have it anymore, but it was good. I don't want to be that way. I, t I told our staff and I, I told my, my husband knows this, my kids, everybody. I am not the one that's going to hold us up. If we have to move up to a camp, 180, 180 acres of land, I will do it. I just told them. I said, listen, I'll do it. I'll move on the camp property. There's nothing up there, people, nothing except woods. I said, I'll do it. The nearest Walmart is like 30 minutes away. I said, I'll do it, except you've got to give me a, a new bathroom. I just cannot take, you know, an old yucky house with an old bathroom. I said, but I'll do it. I'm not going to be the one that's holding us up. And I don't think that you want to be the one that's holding up the move of God, changing those kids that you're ministering to every week. You know, it used to be okay that we got a vision for our department, we got a vision for those kids, we, we found curriculum, we, you know, we believed God for things, we, we, we you know, we're, we're finally getting out of the thing where you're trying to figure out how many things to do, how, how many puppets you can make out of a sock. You know, we're, we're getting to the place where, okay, you can have things in children's church, and the church is, you know, most of the time willing to help you out. It's not good enough to be there anymore, though. Do you know that? God is doing a thing in our young people today, and we, they're, they're going to be out there. And we can help them or we can hinder them. You know, where, all of a sudden, a few years ago, I said, you know what? I realized, I looked around, I said, we can't go into the schools anymore, like Jeremiah was talking about in, in, in Russia. You know, we, we can't go into schools and preach. You used to be able to do a puppet show. You know, you used to be able to do that. You can't even do that anymore. Who's the one, who's the kid, who's going to reach those kids in the schools? Our kids are. We've got to be able to equip them. We've got to give them what they need. And it just isn't good enough that Pastor Van said so. Or my dad said so. We realized after a while that, you know, our kids were, I mean, then they were in a Christian school. They were having all these little debates and stuff like that. And they would say, you know, Mark Jr. would say, well, my dad said this. Well, it's not good enough that their dad says it. Even though it's the Word of God, they need to know what the Word of God says about drinking, about sex, about immorality. They need to know what does the Bible say. It's just, not a, it's just not anymore that it's a good thing not to do that. They need to know what is God saying. Our responsibility in the church, along with the parents, is to recognize those kids that we're ministering to that have a call on their life. And I'm talking, there are kids in your children's churches right now that are called the fivefold ministry. What do you do with them? Are they supposed to wait until they get into high school and then begin to do something? 
It's your responsibility if you see that on them right now to start and begin to do things. Because how long do we have? How long do we really have? You know, um, Rachel Scott was killed. She was one of the martyrs at the, at the Columbine School. Her father came to uh, St. Cloud. And all through, I mean, you know, you're sitting there listening to this stuff and you're bawling and you're crying. But God was speaking to her, showing her things, prophetic things that she didn't even know. But you know what? God knew. It doesn't make sense in my mind. Why would, you know, God, quote unquote, allow this to happen? You know, if he knew that those two guys were going to go in there, couldn't he do something? Have you wondered that? I don't, I don't know. The Bible does say there are going to be martyrs in the last days. But she did what she was supposed to do. And because of that, her father has gone all over the world. Thousands of people have heard her story from one little girl who loved God and was willing to make a stand for him. You know, what he said to her, um, we had her book, and, and I read it, and I didn't see that in the book, but what he said was that she actually witnessed to those two boys like two weeks before that she was killed. She actually talked to them about Jesus, about the Lord. And actually what she began to do the whole year prior to that was she would, would seek out people, uh, kids that were handicapped or kids that were sitting by themselves. She would seek out to the, to the amazement of her friends. You know, her Christian friends would make fun of her. But every day, she would seek out those kids that sat alone at lunch and just talk to them, be a friend to them, witness to them, share with them. She made it and touched their lives, and that's what she was doing. But God is going to expect us to do something because there are kids that have a strong call on their life, and it's not, any, it's not good enough anymore just that we have our bases covered on Sunday. It's not good enough anymore. We have to open our spiritual eyes up, like John was talking about this morning, to see those gifts in those kids. They have things that they're supposed to do, and they're not going to be able to do it on their own. They need our help. This generation today, there is something different about it. God is doing something in their lives, but they cannot do it on their own. They're going to need people standing behind them, working with them, holding them up because you know what we have wisdom do you know that we this past summer we had four interns from mississippi and right now we have three interns and they're all under the age of 25 and you really begin to realize how much wisdom you really do have in some things in fact it's kind of a scary thought today i had to um, rush mark to the airport and um, we just had to zip out the door and both you know our kids mark and melissa were attending the book table. I'm just like going, God, help them, you know. And at the same time, everyone, you know, our staff has, has changed in the last um, six months. But every, we've got three interns in our office today covering it. I'm just, we're just like going, this is, we, we, we're hoping that, you know. I told them before I left, do not promise anyone anything on the phone. Do not make up anything. We will deal with it when we get back. But, you know, it's training that well, next week they're going to, you know, we're going to talk about what happened when we were gone. And we're going to find out what, you know, did they do when we were gone. But that's part of training. You know what I'm saying? That's part of training. But I'm finding out how much wisdom that I really do have, even though I'm not that old. You know, the first fruits of your ministry, you know, Pastor Van and Jeremiah, that's a blessing. There are, if you stick with it long enough, you will begin to see the first fruits. And there was a word that was given to us several years ago that talked about when you make deposits into people's lives, that if you wait, you can withdraw from that. You can draw out of those deposits you make. Um, this summer, we had our camp. We did our camp. We rented um, two years ago. Mark just said, we're going to do camp. God told me we, we need to start doing something. And um, 
So we said, okay, we rented a university, um, their campus in the summer, because all the college students are gone. And um, so for two weeks, we had five sessions of camp. And uh, the past two years, we had uh, one of our girls that was on the ministry team. She's 23 years old right now. And she's a, a school teacher, fourth grade at a Christian school, very good school in Minneapolis. And she's helped us. Well, she was our first fruit. When her and her brother first came to Living Word when we were there, um, she was 10 and he was 8. She was on our ministry team and stayed all through it through her high school years until we left. And her brother did the sound for us. Right now, Seth is um, 22 years old. He is the sound guy for Living Word Christian Center. Pastor Mac Hammond is our pastor. The church is about 6,000 people. They have Brother Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, you know, Jesse Duplantis, everybody in there. And he's the guy responsible to make sure the microphone works. Where did he learn that? Where did he get it? He's 22 years old. He got it because there was nobody in children's church, and we had a sound system, and we had to use it. And so we said, Seth, you're doing it. Go over there and, you know, make this thing work. Krista, after camp this year, she went to her principal at the school, and she said, listen, I really have to talk to you as soon as possible. She sat down with him and said, you know, after this year of, of teaching, I'm not coming back. She said, I'm going to be uh, Mark and Debbie's camp director up at their camp. And so she is going to be coming back this summer being our camp director. So if you stay with it long enough, you will see the fruit of what you're doing. But part of that is there are some things you're going to have to do now with those kids. There, you know, our life has to be separated from the world. In ministry, there are things that you do and you don't do. And it takes a little bit more effort than just coming in and sitting on a pew. We have to, we've learned that, and it's your responsibility to train those young people the same thing. I'm going to talk about some things, and um, hopefully I won't step on too many toes. It's our responsibility to nurture, guide, and protect those kids that we, all of them, but there's certain kids that you can recognize and see the hand of God in their lives. There's a call there. The Bible talks about Every single one of us are called to do something. Every single one of us. Some of us, you know, all of a sudden when you become 25 years old, it, it just doesn't turn on. Oh, you're called to be a pastor. Or, oh, you're called to be an evangelist. It, it just doesn't be, begin there then. It's there before they're born. Some of them are recognizing it, and some of them you're thinking, you know, I see them. I'm not really sure what's going on here, but you need to, Turn on your, your spiritual eyes and recognize that they are called and you need to be doing, putting a little bit more effort into those kids, pulling them aside, doing some things with that. One thing you need to recognize is that, let me back up and just say, um, Jesus ministered to the multitudes of people, but he discipled 12. Those 12 men did everything with him. They ate with him. They slept with him. They, they did everything with him. He didn't do all that kind of stuff with the multitude. Don't you know, I'm sure there were people that wanted to be a part of that 12 and probably griped about it. What's he doing with those 12 guys? Look at Peter. I'm sure, I, you know, they knew Peter. They knew John. They knew all those guys. And so when you begin to develop a worship team like Pastor van has and ministry teams prayers intercessors there's going to be people that are saying why why did those kids get to do it and not this one over here or my kid some kids you don't want doing stuff but don't be shocked when when you start hearing rumblings oh that's just a click i was so sick of hearing that word i thought a click what are you talking about like we're sitting around playing games all the time you know, these kids are coming to church and they are taking time out of their schedule to come and practice. Yeah, we get to go out on the road, but you know what? They have to be there practicing. They have to get up early. They have to stay later. This is not a fun and game thing we're doing here. We're, we're serious about what we're doing. And so don't be surprised when you start hearing that. You're going to be taking, you're going to be, when you, when you see those kids, you need to begin to pour into them. Now, one of the things that I've recognized and seen 
is that the devil doesn't like it when we do that. He doesn't like anything we're doing anymore with kids. And that he is a seducer to all of us. There are certain things that he can plant thoughts and ideas in our minds and tr to try to, what does that do? What is a seducer? To try to draw us away from where God really wants us to be. And to seduce is to draw away. There are things that he is going to begin to do to work against what God has in those kids' lives. I mean, we see it all the time. I mean, everywhere you look, there's uh, TV uh, everywhere. You have to be prepared for that, to recognize that, because right now, he's working on your kids and your church, and if you have children of your own and you are actively involved in ministering, he is working on your kids right now. Right now. We, I was at a conference um, a couple years ago. Billy Brim was there, and she was talking to 600 women, church women. We're not talking about bring your on, say, friend. We're talking about women that were in the church, and she was talking about seducing the spirit and how the enemy wants to come and paint the picture of, you know, paint the picture of the And when you take a bite of that, when you step into that picture that he's painted for you, you begin to realize this is the devil. This is not God. And out of that um, 600 women, she's, and she's primarily at this specific time, she was talking to women about being seduced into, you know, ungodly relationships with other men. 200 women went forward. It was a seed. It was either like a seed or it had even gone for. And I'm talking about women, not just friends, people that are at the church. When she was ministering that that day, my whole inside was burning. I mean, it just, I could hardly sit in my chair because I thought, you know, this is happening to our kids. We are working hard. We are, are, are working hard to minister to them, but yet there's an enemy that's working against us in their lives at them, chewing at them constantly. If you're not aware of it, you're going to miss some things. Um, Mark, shortly after that, Mark gave an altar call. We're still at a church there, locally at a church, and um, he said, you know, some of you feel like you're missing out. This is a lie. This is a picture that the enemy has painted. He's painted it to you, he's painted it to me, and he's painting it to our kids. And those kids that you're trying to work with, trying to draw on, he's painting it to them. You're missing out on all the fun. He gave this altar call and had those kids raise their hands up. You know, the kids that raised their hands up were not the kids that just came on Sunday mornings or whatever. The kids that raised their hands up were the kids that were on our ministry team. The kids that were there Sunday morning, Wednesday night, their parents were hooked in. Why? The devil's lying to them. You're missing out. There's something that you're not getting because you're giving all your time in the church. Mark was shortly after that. Mark was ministering, and I was sitting back at the soundboard, and he was talking about his childhood growing up and how his life was not normal. And, um, you know, he said, how many of you ever felt like that? Your life was not normal. He wasn't asking for a response, but one little girl raised her hand, and lo and behold, I'm sitting in the back. Melissa raises her hand up. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, <clears throat> one thing I'm learning with working with young people, you cannot be shocked by what they say, do, or tell you. So I just waited for a day or two, and then I said, you know, honey, 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 why did you raise your hand up? Do you remember? She said, well, yeah. And I said, well, you know, I mean, there's two things going on here, like shock. You know, and then really like, what is she talking about? And so she goes, well, Mom, it isn't. Our life is not normal. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, we have to be at church so early. We have to stay so late. And Dad has to do that. And you're doing this. And we have to do that. And I said, wait a minute here. I said, that's true. That That is true. I'm not arguing. Get up, two services, blah, blah, blah. We do that. But no, wait a minute here. This summer, how many, how many summer camps did you go to this summer? So, now, six months ago, or I forget.
forget what it was, a year ago or whatever, we took a trip, and where did we go to? Where did we take? Well, we had gone on a missionary trip to uh, Portugal. In the meantime, we stopped in London, England, and then we went to Portugal. And uh, Mark had promised the kid, believe me, if you tell your kids something, you have to do it. He told them, he'd gone over there several times, and he told them, you know, when you get old enough, you know, you can come with me to Portugal. It was a good trip. It was a really good trip. But they got to go. Why did we do that? I mean, it was hard. Pastor Van, you've taken your whole family. It's not the easiest on those planes for hours and hours and hours taking kids to go be a missionary somewhere. But why? So they can be a part of what we're doing. So they can see when dad is gone for a week and a half, what is he doing? What is he really doing? They got to be a part of that. Well, you know, I began to explain to her, you know, you're getting to do things because of what mom and dad do that not every kid gets to do. There are some kids that don't even get to go to one summer camp. There are some kids that have never gone out of their state. You get to go all over the world. You know, our, our thing with Mark and Melissa is they're counting off the states they have gone to. I, I forget where they're at. Mark Jr. has actually surpassed me at but, you know, his goal in life is to go to each state and also to each, you know, continent and each province. So we'll see that. But these are lies that the enemy is painting to your kids while you're here, your kids in your church. What is the solution? Well, the solution is that you shine the light where there's darkness. When the devil is lying, you tell the truth. We have three interns that have come, and they're going to be with us until this summer. And, um, you know, we're trying to, we're, we're, it's interesting, let me just tell you that. But we um, have a Bible study every morning from 8.30 till 10 o'clock. Believe me, that is not in the natural mind and in the flesh. You know, there's a whole lot of work, you know, work in ministry that we get involved in that, you know, taking that. 8.30 to 10 o'clock every single day out of my day. But I said, God, whatever. You know, you're going to have to, like John said, you're going to have to make up my time. You're going to have to help me so I don't make any more mistakes like being marked in two places. <laughs> it's my fault. I'm... I know you didn't. You were very kind. Very... But... You know, it's taking the time that we have to to seek God. And with these interns, we're training them that you start out the day this way, 8.30 till about 10 every day. And um, I knew we were getting ready for fresh fire that happened two weeks ago, and um, we've had um, church staff change over. It's all changed in the last six months. You know, God began to speak to our hearts again. You know, we're, we're sensing things going on. And six months ago, um, in the last six months, our whole ministry has changed from, we had two couples that worked with us. They were older than us. And not, not that there's anything wrong with that, except um, and, and it, as time goes on, you begin to see how God's doing. At the, at the moment that things are happening, you're like, well, I don't know what's going on. But I can see that, that the t God has been changing what we're doing and changing our hearts, and we're moving with him. But these people over here didn't want to. And so, you know, they, they quit or they left or they're doing something else. And that's okay. They can do that. But we're going on. You know what I'm saying? We're going to move. We're going to be in what he wants us to do. So our whole staff has changed. And we've got these three interns here. And I said, now listen, we're getting ready for this big conference. And um, I said, I work. I get here when you're here in the morning. And I usually stay till like 5 or 6 at night. But I said, in about a week or so, this is all going to change. I said, this is my routine. I, you know, we've worked out this agreement, Mark and I. And I said, I'm coming in early. I'll get here about 7 o'clock or 7.30. And I'm staying only till 3.30. And the reason why is because that's when Mark and Melissa get out of school. And I'm going to be home with them. And, we're gonna them, and Mark's going to come in at you know, 8.30 and he'll stay later. I said, so don't be alarmed when you don't see me here at 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock. I said, now, Aaron, he travels with Mark. They go out. They leave on 
Um, usually they leave Friday morning. They're gone Friday. They're working Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But Sunday night they come home. Monday, he's not going to be in the office. So don't look for either Mark or Aaron. He'll be back in on Tuesday. And I said, you know, I don't want the devil lying to you. Why is she not working as late as I have to? Why is she not staying until 5? I have to stay here. They're making me stay here if I. Why is she leaving early? I thought, the devil is not going to get in. We're going to, you know, dispel this. You do that by shining light. You need to teach your children and your young people that you're ministering to how to hear the voice of the Father. If they know how to hear them, hear him, they will not follow the voice of a stranger. That's something very, very simple. But how many of you know we get so distracted, so, so off because of just hearing the wrong voice? Really quickly, inward witness. Well, we're going to take a little, we're going to do a little exercise. Right? It's hard to explain, so we're just going to show you how I do this. This is very easy. I've done this with preschoolers on up. So your preschool children, if you're ministering to them, they can, they can get this. But this is one way you can teach them. I'm going to show you right now. I want you to close your eyes. We're going to take like two seconds. Normally, if you were doing this with your kids, you would take longer. You know? but I'm going to kind of speed it up a little bit. You'll get the idea of what I'm saying. We're going to take just a minute here, and we're going to all pray in tongues. I want, I want to hear everybody. None of this mumbling business. Quietly to yourself, I want to hear you. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to pray in the Holy Spirit for just a minute. Take a deep breath. Relax a little bit. Okay, keep your eyes closed. Now listen, I'm going to say some words, and I want you to listen down inside when I say these words to you. Jesus loves you. Just listen down inside your spirit. God hates you. Jesus heals us. God makes us sick. eyes. Now when I said to you the words, Jesus loves you, what did you sense or feel? What did it feel like? Felt warm. Felt like a warm, velvety feeling on the inside. How about when I said that God hates you? What did that feel like on the inside? Felt yucky, cold, bad. That's one way that we can be led of our spirit. And preschoolers, three, fours, and five years can get this. They can get it. That's how, the number one way that God's going to lead us. You know, I, we, Mark and I went uh, with Mark's mother to uh, on a trip to go visit his brother in Germany. And um, they went to go get a car or something. And so she wanted to go get coffee with Mark's mom. And so we're 9 o'clock in the morning walking around Frankfurt looking for a coffee shop. But as we're walking, I'm just feeling like, you know, just uneasy. Oh, and we're taking a corner here, taking a corner there. And all of a sudden, you know, you're seeing a few people here and there, but it's just kind of not feeling right. And all of a sudden, we turn a corner, and there's this building, and it says, Eros! Well, I don't know much, except I know that that's one of the four words for love, and that means sex. So I'm thinking, we're in the bad part of the neighborhood. We need to get out of here. But I first recognize that because as we're walking, I can tell I'm feeling uneasy. And that's how your kids are going to recognize. I mean, shoot, they're going to be in school. How safe are our schools? How safe is anything anymore? You know, if you want to look at things that way, we've got to train them how to recognize and to, to sense, and that's one way you're going to do that. The other way is to, and I've done this with preschoolers also, is by listening for the inward voice. You'd basically do it the same way. You'd have a moment of quiet time, prayer. Um, if they don't know how to speak in other tongues, it's just being quiet, worshiping God, and then just being quiet. And as you sit there, God, as we shut our minds off, God will begin to speak to us. He does that to us all the time. 
And so then I, you offer them a chance you want to share what God spoke to you. I always want to screen it first and put it that way. Because sometimes you just never know. Sometimes, most, a lot of times it's God loves me, Jesus loves me, but every now and then there's something that God is saying. And, but this is training, church training, get it? We're training them. So you want to train them. They know the voice of the Father, the voice of a stranger. We need to teach our young people today to deny themselves. Let's look over at Mark chapter 8. That's right. Lady up here said that means we're going to have to deny ourselves, and that's true. Are we changing? Yes. Come on. We need to sound a little more enthusiastic than that. Do we want to change? Yes. Do we want our churches to change? Then we need to be willing to change. Amen. Mark chapter 8, verse 34 says, And when he called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In order to follow him, we are going to have to deny ourselves of some things. And our young people today do not know that. Like John was saying earlier, we go through the drive-thru. We want it right now. They don't know. You know, I, told my, I tell my kids all the time, you know, when I was a kid growing up, we didn't have a microwave. We didn't have a VCR. Those are luxuries of today that our kids have grown up with that, that talks about quick speed now, 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 now. They don't know. We have to teach them what it's like to make ourselves wait. Make ourselves wait in the presence of God. Why is it so hard? Because we live in a society that says we don't have to wait. We have to teach them what that means to deny themselves. Over in Psalm chapter 106. Again, I'm talking about those kids that we're pulling aside that they know. Some of them know they're called to be missionaries. They're called to be pastors. We need to start training them. You train yourselves. You deny yourself. Uh, Psalms chapter 106, verse 35 says, They did not destroy the nation concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their work, and they served their idols which were a snare unto them. Do you remember in the Old Testament when um, the Israelites would go and God would say, kill everyone, everyone, everything, kill it? Well, that sounds kind of harsh today. Why was he saying that? Because they were heathen. God knew. Well, sometimes they didn't do that. They disobeyed. They didn't do that. And so what they were saying was that they were in verse 35, they were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. Do you know that this Satan is the God of this world? We are living in this world. We're not of it, but Satan is the God of this world. But there is a force out there that is pushing against us. We are going against the grain. And we have got to, as the church, stand up and be bold and say, you know what, we're not going to do that. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about Holiness. A couple of quick statements. Holiness is judging yourself, allowing God to show you what you need to give up. We're talking about, I want to change, I want to change. But are you willing to turn the TV off? Legalism is judging others. This is, a, this is you know, when we were writing this curriculum, and God began to deal with me. You know, we're talking about things with these kids, and we're like going, you know, we need to move from, there's, there's got to be a separation between us and the world. And if you're called, there needs to be an even bigger separation. Why does the news media get all over a preacher that missed it? Why? Why do they do that? Because they know there's supposed to be a difference. 
men of God are not supposed to be sleeping around with any woman they want to. It's okay for the world to do that. It's okay for, for it to be all over everywhere. But the minute a preacher does it, it's wrong. And it's right. It is wrong. No one should be doing that. Holiness is based in humility. A humble heart, a humble mind. We're not going after a list of rules of what we can do to live in holiness, but we're asking God, we're breaking our heart and saying to him, what do I need to do? I want to be more like you. Legalism is based in pride. Legalism is, you know, I don't do this, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do this. Taking comfort in that. Holiness flows out of a love and a passion for Jesus. If you really, you know, what would Jesus do? It's all over the place now. But do, do we ever think about it anymore? What would Jesus do? You know, our kids, they're 14 and 12, so they ask us all these questions or they begin to start doing stuff, and that's what we throw back at them. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Legalism flows out of a list of rules and focuses on the outer man. Now, when you are living a holy life, your outer man will be affected, and it should be. But it's not based on if I don't do this and I don't do that. It's based on out of your heart. What are you willing to lay down? Holiness is produced by the power of the Spirit of God. Legalism is produced by the works of the flesh. Sometimes there are just some things we are not going to be able to on our own. Legalism will do it. What I cut off, what I set, you know, what I'm going to do, um, what I set my mind to, I'm going to not do that. We have to be that way, but holiness will flow out of our heart. You know, if we really, 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 really believed that God lived in us, we wouldn't be doing some of the things we're doing. Treating people the way we treat people sometimes. And if our kids, again, if we're going to move and change, we've got to move and change. It's going to mean giving up some things that maybe aren't so bad. Like I said, turning off the TV. How can you go to an R-rated movie Saturday night and or Friday night and then go stand up and minister and preach to those kids Sunday morning? Think about it. The church, we don't even know what sin is anymore. It became, it's become a, uh, uh, you know, what is sin? Well, sin is basically disobeying God. But, you know, we as Christians, you know, we don't really sin anymore. You know, we're Christians. We're ministers. We're preachers. But really, sin is disobeying God. If we really searched our heart, sought after God, we would be cutting out things on a daily basis. But you know, we don't take we don't take the time, like John said, we don't take the time to get ourselves in His presence. Because if we did, there'd be a whole lot of more stuff going on. Sometimes those things that we hang on to are weight that hold us back. You're wondering, some of you may be wondering, why aren't things going the way that I think they should be? Maybe there's some things we need to let go of. Maybe there's some things that we need to allow God to show us to let go of. You know, there's things in you right now that God wants you to do and you're not doing it because you don't know. Did you know that? Before you were a Christian, before you were born again, God wanted you to be a Christian. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you before you recognized that you needed him. See what I'm saying? Can you see the connection? Before you knew that you needed Jesus, God had provided him for you. There are things in your life that God wants, and you know what? He wants it so much more for us than we do. He really does. Who's holding it up? We are. 
We are because we're hanging on to things. We're not letting things go. We're not changing. We're not sensing the time. We're not moving when we should be moving. We need to recognize what God is doing and be willing to lay things down. Because you don't, ha you don't have to. He's not going to make you. You can stay right where you're at. Never change. There are people, there are ministry, I'm sure, Pastor Ben, you know it too. There are people's lives that we have come across in ministry that you, men, women, you see the call of God on their life, and they, they just have to make a change. They have to, you know, go for it. Quit their job and go for it. But they won't do it, so they're still in the same place. There's a couple that... Um, we, when we were at Living Word, it was like 1987, I guess, when we first started there. There was a couple there, Mitch and Julie. They began working with us in children's ministry, and you could just, we could just see it. They were called. Well, they still are at the same church, doing the same thing, loving God and everything. And Mark talked with Mitch a little while ago and said, you know, asked him some things, and um, we actually wanted him to do some stuff for us, and he said, no, we didn't want to. And um, I'm like, okay. But he said, you know, I have, I've had five offers um, to be a children's pastor. And we're like, well, why, why are you still where you're at? Because if that's what God's wanting you to do, if that's what God's called you to do, then why are you still here? Well, it just, I just don't feel right. It's not, it's not right. It's not the right well, you know, we began to think about it, and we asked him, you know, um, he was in sales, and we said, you know, Mark was asking him what his salary was because we were going to be looking at hiring him. And he told us it's like $100,000 a year in sales. Well, you know, God has come a long way, but I don't know any church that pays $100,000 for a children's pastor, let alone their senior pastor. But praise God, we just got the word last week. He has accepted a call to a church in Georgia, and we're excited. Because you see gifts in people, but they hold themselves up. They hold themselves up, so we're excited. One last thing, I'll quit in just a moment. I don't know how long I'm supposed to go anyway. So. You need to be bold. When I was talking about holiness, there's a whole lot more there. Our young people need to know, what is that? In fact, I'm going to go right back. There's a young girl. She's probably 14 right now. She, we worked with her, and um, she is called. She knew it three years ago. She was called. God spoke to her at camp. She was called to be a missionary. She was called to go on the mission. She's done some trips with her mom. And I told her mom <clears throat> at the time when she, that this happened, when she first told us she was 12 years old, I told her mom, I said, you know, I said, you need to, she came, the, the father, I don't even think she knows who her father is, it's just her and her daughter. She's 12 years old, and I said, listen, you need to watch what kind of clothes she wears. What, do, what kind of connection does that make to being called a missionary? I said, you know, you need to watch this is a mom, single mom with her daughter. They love God. She's called to be a missionary. But I told her, I said, you need to watch what kind of clothes you let her wear. Because she's all the time wanting to wear tight, low cut, short, everything. I said, you really need to watch what kind of clothes you wear. Well, why? What's the big deal? If she's called to the mission field, she is going to be, she is going to have to do some things before she gets there. And wearing, is it, is it really the clothes? Not really. It's the attitude behind what she's buying. Why do you have to have the tightest top? Why do you have to have the shortest shorts? I'm telling you, this last year at Easter time, I just was having a fit because I could not find anything for Melissa to wear for Easter. It was all like half see-through and this little spaghetti strap stuff and 
either that or it was way up here, and it was ridiculous. I thought, this is crazy. What difference does it make? It makes a lot of difference because it's an attitude behind what she's wearing. It's the attitude behind what she's wearing. She's got to put that aside. And number, I don't want to go into a whole, we, we all know it, what the, the guys in the world today, when they see that, they're, that's saying something to them. They don't understand it. They just want to wear what's the latest style or what they think the latest style is. The Bible tells us to be modest. Do, you have to wear, do they have to wear bags over their heads and over their bodies? No. Is it going to be a little bit more effort? Yes. But if she's called to the mission field, she needs to start working on some of these things now. Because what? Does that mean she's not going? No, she'll probably go, but it may take her a while. Why? How close is she willing to get to God? You know what I'm saying? She, in fact, that, that same girl, I talked to her mom one summer. The next summer she was at camp, and, and you know, we had a very strict, you know, strict rule about no dating among anybody or the campers or anybody, and she knew that, and they weren't there doing ministry. But here she was up at the front altar and, you know, holding hands with a guy from another church. And we're like going, wait a minute here, come on. Is that a big deal? I think it is. I don't think any kid should be thinking that way at all. Well, I'm going to tell you one last story. We were at a church, and um, we, we, we've always had different rules about ministry, about the kids in ministry, involved in ministry, about no dating, none of that type of stuff. And um, the kids that were on our ministry team at the time, we, you know, you hear little things here and there and everything. Well, it got to a point where we realized um, it's a little bit more involved than, you know, so-and-so thinks they're cute or whatever. And it had to deal with the kids that were on our ministry team. There were two that started it, a boy and a girl, and ever since they were little, you know, this is what everyone told us. Oh, ever since they were little, you know, they just always played together and did everything. Well, now they're, you know, 12 and 13 years old, and so, you know, they are like boyfriend, girlfriend type thing and everything. Well, our son was involved in this. There was a group of kids, there were boys and girls, and they were going with each other and doing all this stuff. And so finally we just said, I said, you know, I don't know, Mark. I said, we don't like this, but I said, maybe we just need to get the parents and the kids involved together. Just to say, this is the deal. We don't allow them to date or do anything like that. And we're talking 10, 11, 12. This is what we're talking. And I said, the only thing I know to do is get the parents together. You know, certainly I would want to know this. I thought everyone else would want to know it. So we got the parents together, and oh, my gosh. They did not like the idea. They thought we were ridiculous. You know, we were out of line. Because we're saying we don't want them sitting next to each other. We don't want them holding hands. We don't want them dating. One of the moms of the, the girl of this, this, this little couple that kind of, you know, the whole thing got rolling after them. Uh, you know, Mark said, well, what are you going to do when they break up? And she said, we don't ever talk about it because they're not going to do that. You know, kids at that age, they're not, okay, they're not even holding hands let alone having sex. But what they are doing that people don't recognize is they are giving away their heart to that person, however big or small it is. That, you know, my son came to me one day and he said, Mom, I've been dumped five times. You know, he was 12 years old. I said, well, you know, ugly here, but why, how did that feel? It feels terrible. I said, yeah, because you're not supposed to do that yet. So they're not involved. Some of them may be, but hopefully the kids in church aren't. Kids in the world are. But they're giving away, <coughs> away their heart. And that's more dangerous than it is, I'm sorry to say, but, you know, having sex to some degree. Because you're giving of your emotions. You're giving the, the traumatic, when they, they don't, aren't around that person any longer, the emotional withdrawal that they have is incredible. 
And, you know, in a situation like that, they just have to get over it. There's no easy way. You have to work through that. You have to walk through that and comfort them. But they should never have to feel that. They should never have to deal. God didn't intend for us to get married 50 times and break up, have divorces. God didn't intend that to happen. And he doesn't intend for our young people to be going with each other, breaking up, going with, I forget who said it, but somebody said, you know, they're practicing divorce. God did not intend for our young people to have to deal with those sorts of emotions. There's too many other things we have to deal with. And so the last thing I want to say to you is you need to go back. You need to sort out everything you've heard. When you leave here, everything that you feel right now, this isn't it. When you leave tomorrow or Sunday, that, that's just not it. When you get back, it's going to start unfolding. It's, gonna, it's like, you know, the moose. You know, I spread, shake it up every morning. It starts out small and, you know, that I put on my hair. It gets big. Well, when you leave here, what God is doing in your heart is going to expand if you allow it to. Don't just say, you know, you may be tired, you may be um, fighting things in your mind, but when you go, there are things that God has done here in your life, and it is only going to grow when you leave. But one of the things that you need to realize is you need to be bold to speak the truth. One last thing is you need to know where your pastor is on some of these issues that you're going to have to deal with. People ask me all the time, well, it's hard to, you know, I, I believe in, you know, um, our kids and holiness and everything, but, you know, I just, you know, the parents fight it. Well, yeah, they are. You're going you're gonna to have, the greatest battle you're going to have to some degree in some ways is the parents of those kids that are called. Sometimes it's that and the devil. You know, Jesse was David's father, and one more thing. Samuel came to Jesse's house to look for, to anoint a king. Could you imagine? Just take a moment and think. The greatest preacher you could think of comes to your house. You have a slew of kids. He says, I'm here to anoint one of them. Jesse had in his mind who he thought God had anointed. And it wasn't David or who God wanted to anoint. He had all his boys line up and, you know, the pride, the, the feeling, the good feeling he must have had, and he's thinking whoever it was that he thought, and, you know, Samuel passes him by, and he's thinking, no, wait a minute, missing. Thank God that Samuel had enough in him to say, you know what, it's not these guys, there's got to be someone else. Where is he? Thank God that he, that he knew enough and had enough that he didn't just say, oh, well, okay, you. Hey, how many times have we settled? He didn't settle. He said, no, no, nope, I don't know. There's got something else. There's got to be somebody else. Is there anyone else? Yeah, there was. Jesse, David's dad, didn't see it in him. Did you see that? God saw it in him. God wanted him to be anointed for king, but Jesse didn't see it. There are going to be things that you see in those kids that you minister to that their parents may not see. You need to be bold enough with the confidence of the Holy Ghost in God to be um, not rude, but to speak the truth in love. We need to recognize that today, that we need to take a stand. We need to be bold in our stand and not back off. Because if we back off, guess who's going to rush in and take our place? It's not going to be... You know, the guy next door, it's going to be the enemy. Thank you very much. I don't know if I'm over or not or what. You did great. Thank you. And time makes no matter anymore at this point. Right? Right. But there will be a time limit on this next thing. But uh, one thing I want to tell you, I guess I must be the best man in the world because never 